You're going to suffer at some point, you need a reason to suffer and then also a collective reason to strive to be better than what you were yesterday, something beyond yourself. Well, hello, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, mate. It's all right. I mean, you're a colorful character. Um, I seem to recall as well, we, we had an event and I asked you to speak at, and I absolutely butchered it because some poor uh, team wanted to dance after and you had to stop halfway through. So <laughs> I, was, I thought I had a feeling the, the actual feedback from when you started, they're like, oh, I feel like this is going to be really good. <laughs> and then I just stitched it up. So we got you back and we want to hear a bit more about you. But wh tell me about your COVID journey, though. That's always quite interesting. Yeah, it's been pretty good, actually. I, I think there are a lot of positives out of COVID-19. Yeah. Know there's a lot of um, uh, disruption and a lot of uh, complexity that we have to deal with. Mm. But um, in general, I think there are more positives than, than, than we might realize. Yeah. Uh, my personal I've been loving COVID, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, impressive. <laughs> yeah, it's forced innovation, which is uh, which I like. It's something like that, eh? Hey? Yeah, 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 no choice. Necessity breeds breeds innovation, I guess. It does. Yeah. But let, let's hear about you. We we know you got a great moustache, but that, that's just a starting point. Yeah. What, what's your background? And why are you here? And what, what's going on with you, mate? Yeah. Well, um, for for those of you who don't know me, my name's uh, Colite Miles, and um, yeah, I'm a, a community leader here in Auckland. Um, and a business agility coach. And we can talk a little bit about what that means a bit later. Um, but yeah, a little bit of background story. Would that help? Yeah, yeah no, All please right. do. All right, we can do that. Tell us, mate. Um, so born and raised in sub-Saharan Africa. Good start. Uh, of all places. Yeah. Um, in and out of war zones. Um, so I experienced my fair share of um, really interesting circumstances. Mm. Uh, I've been in uh, communities that were experiencing extreme duress. Um, from lots of different circumstances and, and it's kind of interesting to see how humans uh, show up um, mm. when when you know the chips are down and, and and we need to pull together and look after each other and that sort of thing so um, been quite humbled actually by some uh. of those uh, those scenarios taught me a lot mm. um, so sort of Africa went into uh, my circumstances there led me into the South African military I served as a, a, a sub-mariner Submariner. Um, yeah, submariner. Going to sea on submarines, for those of you who don't know what a yeah, submariner yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's me. <laughs> I'll show you. Okay. Oh, I know. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Um, did that for about four years. Um, met my partner. Started to dream of a better life and yeah. a different life. Um, uh, moved to the UK. Uh, mm -hmm. Studied in Birmingham in the UK. Did a computer science degree there. Um, got recruited out of university for a large... Uh, European uh, conglomerate called uh, Siemens. Mm. Uh, they do, they, at the time, they had a huge portfolio of companies. Um, and I went into their technology uh, division and yeah. as part of a leadership program. And that was super cool. Got yeah. to work with the BBC and all sorts of mad, cool projects. Uh, What's behind the there. curtain? What, what are the behind BBC? The yeah, tell us. <laughs> they're all polished in the front, but are they perfect in the back? Oh, they're, they're such a fascinating organization. Okay. Yeah. yeah, they're like... Um, uh, they're they're owned by the by the public, so they're a, a public uh, entity. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure. It's a fun fact for you about the BBC is that they're uh, they're actually not allowed to advertise um, or not allowed to post adverts uh, for sale. Oh. So companies can't sell uh, products or services through BBC channels. Oh. So when you're watching the BBC, you'll yeah. see that all of the ad spots are promoting other programs within the BBC sort of family. Huh. Yeah, I so didn't know funded that. by the public um, wow. taxpayer money. Sorry, that, carry on. Uh, carry on with yeah. your Birmingham. Yeah, no, uh, no, yeah. So oh, that's interesting. Yeah, okay, back to Birmingham. Yeah, so uh, Birmingham, um, uh, computer science, then into Siemens, uh, specialized in business design. I think that that was my area of, of interest. I, I would often introduce myself as being a business designer by trade. <laughs> yeah. That's a good name. So I just kind of studied the, um, uh, the way that we can configure our businesses to meet its purpose. Mm. Um, so if you think of in, in engineering terms, um, I would build a tool or an instrument to meet a certain need. Um, so in the same way you could think about a business and you could say, well, what is this business set up to do? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's configure it to meet its purpose. Okay. Um, so there's a whole discipline that would go with that, um, thinking through the organization, you know, the customer experience, business model, uh, product development or s uh, services that it would offer. Um, so so that's, that's kind of my grounding. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, moved to 
New Zealand in 2008 now to start a young family. Good time to start. <laughs> oh, it was just amazing, really. So it was the end of the golden age. It was just as the GFC was slamming into Europe. Yeah. And I honestly felt like the, the ground was falling away behind me as, as we sort of uh, got on the plane, you know, mm. to leave. And uh, long queues outside of Northern Rock Bank and mm. all sorts of signs of... Um, uh, of, of, of upheaval, upheaval and, you know, the news was dropping around um, Lehman Brothers and all yeah, that sort craziness. of thing. Just mad times. So, yeah, moved the family to, to New Zealand. Um, consider myself a proud new Kiwi. Mm. Uh, Welcome. <laughs> in 11 years. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, what happened? Uh, so, it's all a blur, actually. To 10 or 11 years goes goes pretty quickly, believe it or not, once, yeah. you, once you pass 30. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll let you know. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll look forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so here I, I kind of recognized that um, a, a bit of a calling. Um, I was sort of watching some of the corporate activities and getting amongst it, applying uh, business design stuff. And uh, just noticed that there was a, a really growing conversation around business agility. Like, like our our organisations need to be more adaptable. Yeah, um, huge. And I think that becomes a sort of survival factor, uh, mm. not just a hey, you know, we want to do better than our competition. This is a, actually if we want to stay in the game, we've got to be adaptable. Mm. Um, so I'd gotten more and more curious about that a that aspect of of our organisations. Um, I thought I'd better get uh, some sort of underpinning and I enrolled at Massey University for an executive MBA. Mm. Um, was fantastic. Two years, uh, got to apply a lot of what I learned in a, in a classroom back at, at the companies I was working with. All right, okay. So a lot of people, there's a bit of contradiction yeah. around that perception of that degree. Well, yeah. Why do you think, because yeah. they, they say, oh, you can't learn business in school. What, what, do, you, what do you say back to that? What yeah. would you say? Well, I'd say... Firstly, that it's it's not learning business at school; mm. it's um, learning business administration at school. So yeah. that particular course okay. is a master's of business administration. Ah, oh, okay. So, so I think that that kind of puts it in line. And you're like, oh yeah, okay. Well, if, uh, that's administering one, but that's not learning how to build a business yeah. and going through the hard yards of building up your instincts behind the flight controls. Right? You're not flying the airplane. Sure. You might just be studying about how the airplane might work. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, right. Well played. Is that well kind played. of yeah, not now interesting? <laughs> you also talked about um, yeah. finding purpose in an organization. And that, what's yours, though? Tell yeah, us about yours. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my mission. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so I, I kind of had these epiphanies a couple of years ago, especially when my, my little one was born. So mm. he's 11 years old now. Oh, yeah. And I started um, really thinking about what kind of workplace he's going to enter into uh, in, say, 20 years' time. Mm. You know, So I'm dreaming about that world. And I'm thinking... Wow, I, I really don't want it to suck. Yeah. You with me? Yeah, well, I'll be there, so. Right? Yeah. I don't want that world to suck. So um, I started looking at where we were pointing as mm. a society. And I mean, this is before, you know, oh, sorry, COVID-19 and, uh, and all the other crazy things that have sort of happened before then. And realized that there were some uh, uh, pretty interesting patterns that were going on in the world, uh, mm -hmm. joined conversations wherever I could uh, to learn about these. Um, and they come down to two broad types of pattern. Mm -hmm. One is I think that our environments are becoming more turbulent. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's not a laminar flow or flow of events. There's like a real discourse. So events tend to run, reach an arc, and then pivot off and move that way. Then we have a pandemic. Then, you know, there's fires burning in Australia and we've got global, global climate change. Then Greta Thunberg is, you know, uh, uh, protesting at school. Then we've got, you know, further back than that, you might even talk about Occupy. You know, the Occupy movement, Occupy mm. Wall Street and yeah. all that sort of stuff. And you're like, what is going on? So there's turbulence, right? These upwellings. Things are really dropping and storming around us. Um, and the other thing is, um, the other part to that is exponential. Mm. Uh, so you'll hear about a lot of uh, trends that seem um, like they're far away, right? Mm -hmm. But they, as you get closer to them, they suddenly rush up on us. Yeah. I think COVID-19 is, is a classic example of this, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, we've heard our scientific community warning us about 
um, infectious diseases and that as humans encroach on habitats, we're going to end up interacting with you know, viruses and pathogens that we, we haven't had to deal with as a species. You know? And they've mm. traditionally been very distant from that. But as you know, we've sort of made more contact, we've had more outbursts like swine flu, yeah. right? And people have this sort of vague memory, oh, yeah, well, well, we got through that, that was okay. And then the next one and then the next one and then COVID-19 hits and, you know, it's sort of changed the whole, the whole planet's behavior. So it's one event that's really united the whole of humanity, if you yeah, think about it, right? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It's so back going. to the mission, Keep right? Going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> back to the mission. So this is the world today. It's turbulent. It's exponential, and um, I, I'm, I believe that businesses have a part to play in shaping what happens next, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And um, and so I basically committed my career to building beautiful businesses. Mm. Uh, that's and that's my thing. Um, what is a beautiful business? Yeah. You're about to ask. I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, four P's. Mm -hmm. uh, is the best way I like to think about it. Um, P number one is purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so in that same from the business designer in me says, hey, if you're going to have a business, then make sure you've locked it onto a worthwhile, noble cause. Mm -hmm. Connected to something that's actually going to help us get the planet to be the version that we want in the future, not pointing at the one that sucks. Yeah. yeah <laughs> so let's kind of like, yeah, let's steer for the one that we actually want. Um, so your business needs to have a sense of purpose. Um, that is a little bit noble, I would say. You know? okay. So have that. And then engineer to it. In configure to that purpose. Um, you know, you, you kind of, uh, the, the Buddhists will talk about congruence as mm. a really powerful way, a mindfulness state, right? Yeah, yeah. And, this right. Is, and, and a simple way to think about that is um, your thoughts and your words and your actions. Like your actions it. need mm. to follow your words, eh? and your words need to follow your thoughts. And so if they're all in alignment, you're congruent. Mm -hmm. And you actually have this amazing um, uh, energy that can move in a direction towards your purpose. Great. And I think it's the same for organizations, mm -hmm. you know. So auditing what's going on and making sure it's configured and really on purpose. Um, so that's my P number one. Yeah. P number two. Mm -hmm. It's actually P number two and three sort of go together. Okay. Um, people and planet. All right. So uh, P number, uh, so a beautiful business to me um, is really kind to its people. Almost, and this might be um, counterintuitive, but first and foremost to its employees. So whoever's inside the yeah. business, be kind to them almost the most, <laughs> mm. right? Especially if you're a leader out there and you've got an organization. Um, I once got told two weeks. Ask me what two weeks. Oh, two me. weeks. Tell me about what, two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks? Oh, you, uh, two weeks? <laughs> wow. Let me tell you, Ryan. Oh, wow. Two weeks. So spontaneous. It takes about two weeks for your staff to treat your customers the same way you treat them. Oh. Mm. Uh, hey. Penny. Hey. Okay. Mic drop. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, there you go. So, that was actually Sir David Levine. I was at a dinner with him a couple of years ago. Mm. Levine Paints uh, mm. became Resine later on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he leans over and he says, two weeks. And I'm like, oh, Sir David, two weeks what? And uh, there it is. This, this sort of wisdom bomb. Yeah. Um, really, really kind of sits well. So now if you look after your people, mm. then they're going to look after customers. And they're going to be infected with the glorious sense of purpose. Yeah. Right? And you start to get a bit of a triangle effect. So people and purpose are working really well and your customers are going to start winning. Mm. Right. So that's, that's the sort of uh, second level of, of P's. Yeah, so okay. The first one is purpose. Mm. And then we've got... People. Yeah, baby. Two weeks. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then, of course, planet. Planet mm. links in with that because I think our communities, we, we live on this, this thing called Earth. Yeah. Um, and it's our life support system. So be conscious and attentive to that. And I think even being kind to the planet is a hygiene factor. I don't even think it's like a special thing that you need to add on to your many things to worry about. It's just like it actually is on my hygiene mm. side of the list, you know. Yeah. <laughs> does that make sense? Yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah, so just, you know, sustainability and um, really looking through those lenses of like just what's our footprint on the planet. And there's many, so many ways to, to, to look at that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, that's our, we're around to our second le level there. That's uh, people and planet. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is prosperity. Right? Mm. And it's like prosperity, I think, is a nice way to put it because it adds in the component of profit. So, yeah, have a business that generates profit, mm. but also generates some kind of prosperity for the people that are in it and the people that are around it. For sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, man, you're killing it. You Jeez. Uh, so, that's my beautiful business, man. It's purposeful, it's kind to people and planet, 
and it's prosperous. Mm. It generates prosperity inside and outside. I'm feeling the congruence. Yeah, mate. On yeah. the pur- on the purpose thing, because I always find that fascinating. So obviously the driving factor was a young child yeah. and that, that wanted you to think about the world and, and yeah. to make it beautiful businesses. How do you first start with the individual? Because I have the viewpoint where, sure, you start with yourself, then yeah. the or, overreaching organization, and then you find the people's purpose within the organization yeah. and make sure it aligns. Yeah. So start with number one. How do you find purpose? How do you find purpose? Tricky. Hands Tricky. up, um, who wants the world to suck? <laughs> no hands yeah, up. Yeah, no hands up. Hands up, who wants the world to not suck? <laughs> that would be good. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that. So yeah. the, the not suck version of the future, mm. I find it's fascinating. Whenever you get people to describe, what is the world that you actually want to see? Mm. You know, they'll often describe some version of their reality that's ideal, right? Like it's mm-hmm. a thing. But I've done this on with workshops with hundreds of people, sometimes 50s and the 10s, uh, various different settings. And every time I ask this question, I get an int- the, almost the same response. Okay. I ask um, something to the effect of, all right, now we've explored all the different versions of that ideal future. How many, how many conflicts do we have between your different versions? Mm. You know, how many of you disagree with anything that you've heard now? Do you, is there a chance that your version of an ideal world and my version of an ideal world are compatible? Mm. Huh? Oh, okay. So, so most versions of the – because it doesn't exist yet. There's so much undefined yeah, yeah. that it's, it's possible to have an ideal version of the world that everyone can sign up to that is completely compatible. And yeah. that becomes the kind of North Star. Okay. You know, it's so far away you can't see it. But what we've got to do is inform the choices of how we're going to get there. Mm. And that's when the incompatibilities jump in. Okay, that, that makes sense. sense. Does that offer you an answer? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. I was thinking as well, like they, um, we did this little thing in a, a workshop where it was quite interesting where they got people that had glasses and people that didn't. Yeah. And then they, they talked about your first, your goals, you write them and talk as though they become a reality. Mm, and then mm. you get up and stand and then you switch spots where the persons with glasses and the persons without swap and then they can't see too well. Ah, and they were trying to trying to make the point of, okay, sure, you've got this overreaching vision that you want to make the world not suck, but let's get tactical. Yeah. So you talked about agility. Yep. How do you make a business agile? How do you make a business agile? Or what structures <laughs> or processes are good principles of which to have an agile yeah, business? Yeah, yeah. Oh, That's also beautiful. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, when, I, when I first started looking at... Um, agility, or it crossed my path and it became an area of interest. I was in the UK mm-hmm. and I joined a very small movement at the time um, that was looking to um, radically change the way software was developed mm-hmm. at, at the time, right? And then that sort of gave rise to this movement that we know of today. Uh, it's becoming more mainstream, um, agile practices, agile with a capital A. You know, yeah. There's a whole manifesto behind it and there's a philosophy um, that applies to it. And then the philosophy has given rise to lots and lots of different methods and techniques and you know and everyone's sort of uh, uh, uh trying to pedal their version of it and there's okay. lots of, it's a gold rush at the yeah moment, a right? gold so rush of agile. the agile gold rush okay <laughs> i'm glad, glad i'm part um, of one i i think that it's important to stay grounded in the essence of what benefit it creates in the world like mm. it's the so what mm-hmm. it's like yeah so what if you've got this method or that method or this word or that word um what's the benefit why does that need to happen why does it need to be real in the world and, and why now um, so I think that's when you start to get in, interested and grounded in the idea of agility or adaptability. It's like an organization that is not adaptable, mm. all right, is going to suffer yeah. in turbulence and exponential. And mm. we are seeing it all around us. Mm. Organizations that cannot um, deal with the circumstances that it's finding itself in. Um, so so the, 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 the need is there. We've been feeling the pain. We've seen the life cycle of um, FTSE 100, for instance, mm. uh, companies ma- radically shorten. Yeah. We've seen the average um, tenure of CEOs, global, mm. C- uh, worldwide, we've seen the tenure of CEOs shrinking mm. radically and almost on an exponential curve, not even a linear one. Wow. So it's collapsing back to some point. I don't know why, but there's a tighter turnaround of leadership. Mm. Right. So there's this sort of effect that's happening in our businesses. Um, I, I think that with those signs and symptoms, it's stimulated a response. So there are more and more people like me that are curious about what can we do about that? What can organizations do to become more agile? So thank you for giving me that cue because mm. there's a backdrop to that. Here's the problem that it solves. Mm-hmm. You know, whenever you're as a, as a kind of business designer, you're thinking about, well, let's first talk about the problem yeah. that we want to solve and then go to the solution set. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Right. Now we're into the movement 
has started to, and I'm very pleased in the last sort of, I would say five to 10 years, um, get much more scientific and methodical about how to take an organization through um, various stages to become more agile, to okay. become more adaptable. And it's um, surprisingly nothing, uh, it, agility is, is more to do with the boring bits of the business mm. um, than the exciting bits, like product development and innovations and ventures and research. And, you know, those are kind of uh, natural uh, in the old school way of think, seeing things. That's the, oh, you want innovation? You, you're in the wrong office. You, you need to go down two doors to the left <laughs> yeah, and yeah. find those guys there. They're doing radical stuff, man. That's <laughs> pretty exciting. But over here, we're just like, you know, we're, you know, no, you don't need to find that form off and you're going to have to get it you know sent around the traps and now on tuesdays we only use the pink slip you know <laughs> oh wait wait it's the third monday of this uh yep no you, you've gone around you know, yeah yeah you get, get me it. yeah i'm getting it yeah. you get me that's why i was keenly interested in business administration mm. um so to get to know the other components that make up the functioning of good business good organizations mm. so business agility starts to become a conversation about how can you take the whole thing the whole organization and build agility into its structure and identity and its way of thinking. And it has to start with a way of thinking and a culture. And then the culture gives rise to lots of experimenting and trying different things, mm. but being very mindful of four Ps. What's the uh, number one? You got it. Purpose, people, planet, and prosperity. Yeah, you got Gold it. Stars, so up. if, um, yeah, so I think if we're starting a conversation in an organization around, you know, why, why do we exist and all that kind of good stuff, those are just healthy things to do in a company anyway. Mm -hmm. And you usually end up with some value statement, some mission statement. Um, and those things can stay quite distant sometimes um, to the people on the ground actually doing, yeah. doing the work, right? Sure. Um, but... It's fascinating. I was listening to a uh, an interview with um, a SpaceX astronaut, um, and it was being conducted by IDEO. IDEO is this famous um, design agency okay. that's based in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. and they're a force majeure. They're one of the earliest um, sort of uh, adopters or uh, 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 what would I say, thought leaders around um, design thinking. Uh, from Stanford D School, they broke it. Anyway, long okay. story. So IDEO is busy interviewing this astronaut mm. from SpaceX, mm. and he's talking a little bit about the inner workings of SpaceX, what it's like working with Elon Musk, um, how to get fired, <laughs> you know, a couple of things. Um, and he made a couple of comments. But one of them, he said, um, was fascinating, uh, was that um, everyone in that organization felt the purpose mm. of what they were trying to do and why that was important. Okay. You know? Everyone. Yeah. So... Um, and he cited an, an example of uh, JFK walking, paying a visit to one of the NASA um, labs um, where, uh, you know, they were showcasing some of the technologies that they were using to put a man on the moon. Right? Mm. Remember that famous um, call to action yeah. that he gave in the beginning of the decade. By the end of this decade, we're going to put a man on the moon and we're going to bring him back safely. Do you remember that? In 10 years. So he almost gave the country a 10-year almost impossible mission yeah. to achieve, right? Wow, yeah. Um, and you don't get there with an organization that's plodding along. No. You get there with an organization where everybody's gunning to do to get the same result. Yeah. Uh, and so JFK is on this, uh, on this visit and he's walking down this hall and he's being herded along by an entourage and he encounters a janitor who's busy mopping the floors. And he went over and he just said, oh, hello, and uh, what do you do? And he says, well, I'm helping to put a man on the moon, sir. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, Dreamy-eyed. Yeah. Right? Isn't that cool? It is cool. And that's like kind of the philosophy at SpaceX. This is what this astronaut was telling IDEO. Yeah. Uh, I was like, look, the, and that you feel that at SpaceX. It's like even the people at the reception desk or the mailman or, you know, the, 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 every, every person here, because we're so saturated in the why story mm. that we need to become a multi-planet a multi um, uh, species yeah. because we face extinction otherwise. Sure. And so there's this massive, massive purpose. Yeah. Uh, and then everyone gets infected with that purpose. Now you've got some degree of alignment. You then bring the games in that can help you play to the purpose. Okay. And that's where I think you can get a lot of uh, traction out of um, agile methods. So when you start to look in, you're, we're seeing almost every part of the organizational structure adopting Agile in their own way. Oh, okay. Um, so HR are thinking about, wow, how can we make sure that our systems, processes, policies, all that sort of stuff are set up to bring in people that are excited and, and creative and that can hit the ground running and that are collaborative naturally. Mm. Um, how, you know, we've seen Agile finance. Huh? Mm. Finance? You know. 
they're not agile. Yeah, but if right? they are, yeah. Well, I mean, you think about the sort of traditional way to to run um, a, a a financial cycle inside a business. Mm. You would typically have a budgeting cycle, right? Twelve yeah. month budgeting. End of year, you've got your financial accounting stuff that you've got to get done. Mm-hmm. But you also have this sort of um, twin side of the coin is the management accounting stuff yeah. that helps you operate the business. Okay. And now um, we come from a, a structure or capital, capital uh, structure that says the game you play in business is you predict ahead of time. Mm. So managers would be invited to predict ahead of time what they're likely to achieve. Yeah. All right. Um, they might set budgets. They'll set sales targets. They'll set all sorts of things, mm. all sorts of predicted um, results. All right. And then they will set off. They will push capital into place. And they will carry out their year and hope to get near or above their results yeah. in order to win their bonuses and all that sort of stuff. Mm. So it's a very predictive model. So, it we, is, yeah. so it's a push model. We push capital and resources into place at the beginning of our cycle. And we then play out that hand that we've dealt ourselves essentially. All right. No matter what happens. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you talk to me about, you know, guys that had the unfortunate financial year mm. um, planning events. Right, just be, they've just speculated on twelve months, and in inside twelve months, uh, this uh, torpedo uh, hits with the giant letters COVID nineteen on it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and it's thrown everything up in the air. Mm. So now my budget means nothing, um, but I'm sweating because everything is currently geared in the institution, right, that. to get to stick to the plan. Mm. It says stick to the plan no matter what what's happening. That's the that's the kind of the the systemic. Um, uh, a bias or its, its center of gravity is way over here on predict. Mm. What we're saying with um, business agility is you need to be able to both predict and adapt. So you, you set your intentions, but you play what's actually happening in front of you in the most optimal way. Okay. All right. And you bring that philosophy in. So what we're seeing with finance, for instance, is quite interesting, is the uh, reduction in their business planning cycles. So mm. they would traditionally have long three, uh, two, uh, sorry, uh, 12 months yeah. as the, the, the sort of industry standard, which would be tied to a three-year strategy, right? Mm. <laughs> Everyone's been up the mountain and come back down it's again. It's a prison sentence, basically. Something, it's weird, right? Um, but what we're seeing now is a quarterly business review yeah. is becoming a lot more popular, mm. especially in our larger organizations. And so by reducing that planning cycle to three months, you end up with this ability to adjust everything to trim to a course, right? Mm. It's like sailing. Yeah. You say, I want to get on the other side of Rangitoto Island and I set sail. Do I point at Rangitoto Island? No. I take tide into account. I take wind into account. I take all sorts of, right? Yeah. You know, a, a bad sailor complains about the wind and the tide. A good sailor sets the sails, <laughs> right? Steers a course, designs a course to get there. How do, um? Yeah. okay. I mean, that makes sense to me. Shorter, yeah. shorter cycles, I mean, mm-hmm. makes you more agile and you, you create a, I guess a, a purpose-driven organization because there, there's a you're yes. going to suffer at some point. You need a reason to suffer, and then also yeah. a collective uh, reason to strive to be better than what you were yesterday. Something beyond yourself. Yes. So I'm just thinking. All right. So you got this organization. We could choose a government organization if you want. Sure. How, how would yeah. you? How we're would you seeing, go about? We're seeing the conversation get into our government institutions. Yeah. Well, how can you make them agile? Or like, what would be the process? You come in, you see the key stakeholder, or yeah. you get everyone in, you talk to all of them. Yeah. Well, how would you go about like? Well, for a start, nobody makes anyone agile. <laughs> oh, okay. You're agile now. It's like you. How do I make you fit? <laughs> yeah. True. True. And, and and get into good condition. Mm. I can't make you do that. True. You have to want to. Okay. And not only do you have to want to, you have to go on a sustained, disciplined journey to get there, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're going to run an ultra marathon, you set that objective for yourself and you're like, okay. But then you're going to have to get yourself into a condition. Yeah. Which means you're going to have to undo the condition that you're in. Yeah. So you almost double, it's a double tax, right? Like you're hitting hard in two areas. So that means becoming conscious of the things that are holding you back from achieving that condition. And the things, conscious of the things that are propelling you forward to those. Th- changing. It's the things I have to undo mm. that makes it really hard. So For they sure. block the changes, you know. So, yeah. So, I think in the short answer would be um, if an organization felt the desire, they sensed that desire, um, that if they became committed to building up their condition, you know, and it's like self-help is, is the best way to do this right okay so for instance um i mean i'm ex-military yeah and uh one of the things that 
they would do in a standard military is they would put all of the new recruits through a basic training mm -hmm. course, right? Now that's that's one way of getting into condition. Yeah, yeah. have someone shout at you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you get chased around, and you get your diet basically uh, managed, and uh, there's an awful, awful lot, you know. And in about three months' time, your condition will definitely shift. And the question is, will it stay there? Mm. You know, and you look at me, my condition hasn't <laughs> stayed the, as fit as I was in the military. Um, because something else had to kick in. Yeah. Um, psychologists might call it intrinsic versus extrinsic yeah, motivation, yeah. right? It's yeah. like um, we can impose a system that gives us the motivation from the outside. It's like mm. fear and deadlines. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but I think a much more sustainable form would be intrinsic motivation. Mm. So if an organization really truly wanted to become agile, they would want to um, really convince themselves that that's that there's a good reason to get yourself into a good condition mm -hmm. um, and then become committed to that uh, in, in like a whole, a whole way. Um, so that would be, uh, I would say, start with leaders. Yeah. And that leadership would need to become the change they want to see. Mm. So not about giving leaders an instructions sheet and then go and hit everyone over the head with something called an agile stick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It Come would on. be more um, helping them get curious about the principles, why it works. Um, there's actually a whole movement with techniques and frameworks. Mm. Um, so there's an awful lot more than 10 years ago yeah. uh, to get yourself started and actually activate the benefits. Right. So, yeah, I'd say um, have an organization that wants to change would be the, the, start, the start conditions. Okay. And yeah. then from there, anything's possible, right? If you wanted to get into condition and you call up, you go, well, I'm, I'm going to need help with this. I recognize I need help. So I'm going to call a personal trainer or a coach, or a, right? And that's where someone like me might come in. Mm. Yeah. So I partner with leaders in businesses to help them basically achieve the kind of successes that we're talking about. Yeah, right. That's interesting. I mean, uh, yeah, change is, change is a very challenging thing for people. I mean, I sort of come from the mindset as the – the cost of not changing has to be, you know, it ties oh, you in. Beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was just, but you, there was a few um, trigger words you use, so intrinsic and extrinsic. And, yep. and then also you, you talked about mindfulness, mate. Yeah. Do you meditate? Just to check, where's your um, mindfulness? What's I, your vision? I think I do in my own way. Okay. Um, I've tried meditation in the traditional sense. Um, and it's not a, it hasn't made its way into my lifestyle as a pattern. Okay. But right. I've recognized that I can be, uh, meditative in other ways what would be your yeah. process so yeah so that um the challenge as a human is you know aware of your unconscious biases so yeah. there's underlying things that are influencing the way you think mm. uh, keeping you rigid in your uh willingness to not change yeah so what's your process of self-awareness mine's meditation where i, I uh, observe the thinker so i don't get absorbed yeah. in it and i can assess me instead of my drivers mm. What, mm. what's your way of recognizing yeah. and being self-aware i mean numbers external people how do you oh, keep um, on track so about maybe six years ago okay um i hit this sort of almost crisis point mm -hmm. um i think it was in the golden age of productivity apps Hey, like Trello or, yeah. you know, like, and you just had all these apps and I was bombarded um, with my portfolio. I mm. had this about 30 or 40 different projects and things to do. And I just had, I seemed to have a Slack group and a Trello board and a this and a that for every one of them. Mm. And I was just experiencing uh, like overheating. Yeah. <laughs> I was just overheating as a like, human, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Not sustainable. Um, and I think... I can't remember exactly uh, what happened, but I had this real moment of uh, deep reflection and deep awareness that I have to change something. I have to change something up and do something that makes, that brings it back to my humanity. Mm. Like I'm not a machine. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, so at the time I went on a bit of a search and I had something suggested to me um, called bullet journaling. Have you ever heard of that? No. Bullet journaling. No. So this is um, basically um, a, I was a, a creative director in New York, um, was frustrated with the same thing. So we resonated with the same problem mm. uh, and he uh, created a notation and a system of um, journaling in a blank notebook um, that uh, just cleaned up your thinking, uh, okay. um, helped you externalize uh, some of your thoughts, which mm. then helps you with reflection, right? Yeah, so yeah, you yeah. can reflect back and um, spot patterns that might be interfering with your success. And that's Smart. Sort of so bullet journaling, I can highly recommend. I've Is been doing like it for six years. Yep. What, why, like what's the structure or just writing stuff? 
Um, so I, I would look it up. We can share a link afterwards if you okay. like. Um, but for, for me, it's uh, – so, so the bullet journal, is, it looks a lot like a diary. Okay. But it's a diary that you, that you update and it unfolds with you. So mm. it's not like a pre-printed book that has all your days and times and everything. So it's not about time. Yeah. It's just about the moments that you create to reflect and put some thoughts down on paper. Okay. So it's a system of um, thinking. All right. Um, so typically uh, bullets, like bullet points. Yeah, yeah. All right. So you'd write down bullet points. There'll be a symbol for a task, something that needs to be done. There'll be a symbol for a theme, like it fits within this theme. So I might say, um, I'm going to come and see Ryan Melton. Mm. And I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you. <laughs> Um, but I might have a hashtag Ryan Melton in my book mm. as an entry. And then I might put down two or three tasks that I know I need to do. Okay. Um, book, book some travel, um, uh, prepare perhaps some notes on uh, what I might talk about. Um, make sure I've uh, set up something else uh, for to capture it afterwards and and um, and distribute it around my my business channels. Um, so you know I might have a task list. Mm. I might also have um, another bullet point type called an event, mm. which would say you know something happened while we were. Uh, while we were talking, which yeah. is really fascinating. And I might want to capture some notes like, you know, you've mentioned a few things um, mm. and I might jot those down. So it's an emergent unfolding diary, if you will. Okay. But it captures your thoughts. And what I found is um, that I've really benefited from uh, encountering new ideas and concepts. And I'll put a, a like a powerful quote in there or I might draw a little diagram up of something that I found really enticing. Like I'm fascinated by business models and just ways that things uh, of expressing ideas with pictures and images. Mm. So I'll draw them. And then over time, um, the writing has gotten neater. I've become more deliberate about the types of things yeah. um, that I put in there. I've actually got it in my bag. I can show it to you later. Yeah. Um, but things like, yeah, and then it's, uh, and these ways of planning forward. So at the beginning of every month, you would dedicate a page uh, to write out the mm -hmm. days of the month and the numbers mm -hmm. um, and then just pop in there like what are the events and what are the significant things that need to happen that month and it just helps you um, be more mindful I think not living uh, with an anxiety about the future and not um, regretting the past you know you just kind of I find that that's a form of meditation for me yeah no yeah. it's fair I mean the, the, the common narrative around fear is it's novelty so it's the things that yeah. you don't know or don't understand so the more tangible and real it becomes the less fearful oh, it is that's nice novelty so I might write that down in, <laughs> in your theme but the, the other thing is, yeah. is um there's a part of the brain called the reticular activation system. Mm, and it kind of works mm. like Google. Yeah. You find what you search for. Ah, I love so that. if you want to buy a red car, mm. um, you start noticing all the red cars in the world. So what yeah. you're actually doing with yeah. your bullet point journal is you're actually focusing your attention. Yep. And then you're also trying to find these events. You're trying to find the things you're planning for. You got it. Yeah. I, I use that. Um, you're setting intentions. Yeah. You're being intentional. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Also, um, quite a useful thing from a, a state of mind point of view that I've been using in the morning is is most commonly referred to and used is um, gratitude. It's like oh, lovely. Yeah, because if every morning you're trying to find what you're grateful for, mm. then you try and reinforce that viewpoint as yeah. you go through life. Yeah. Um, another on top of the bullet points, um, yeah. up to you. But the, it's um, voice journaling. It's a lot yes. more efficient. So this would be more of a, mm. an emotional perception as opposed to a tangible side nice. of things. Yeah, so, I like that. Thank you. Yeah. So like if you and I are talking mm. and I suddenly have an emotional reaction that's mm. um, incongruent yes. to what the actual situation entailed, yeah. suggests that there's some unresolved aspect for me. Nice. Yeah. So if I'm sharing so these… It's worth exploring. Yeah. yeah. And being aware of it, it's like a, they talk about it being the shadow of your psyche. Yes. That, and your shadow of your psyche, the, the unclean insecurities that you mm. have mm. can't exist in the light. Mm. So the more aware you become of them yep. and the more data you have from your bullet points, um, you can find it. But Less shadow. Yeah, yeah. the shadow. Um, it's better to have you talk and talk about this tactical well, stuff. Well, you mentioned gratitude and I wondered if I could oh, yeah, um, connect that to business agility. All right. So go. I've got a, a little fun fun thing to try out in your business if, you, okay. uh, you know, if you're out there and you've got a business. Um, um, so, so by gratitude journaling mm. wholeheartedly, and I use my bullet journal for that as well. Oh, okay. Um, now it's kind of fascinating. Uh, there is a trend amongst 
um, management consulting firms to work with clients to help them reduce cost. Okay. So it's often the enticing part of the conversation for businesses like, oh, okay, I've got this big sprawling multinational conglomerate and if you can help me lean that out, you know, like kind of trim the fat from my uh, from my business, you know, yeah, we need to talk, mm. right? So there's this enticing story about removing waste. And yeah. they'll often bring in lean thinking, okay? Um, I think somebody made this um, observation that uh, humans are weird. We uh, <laughs> we tend to get more of what, what we focus on. Yeah. Interesting, right? Mm-hmm. So if we focus on waste, what what do you think would happen then? Oh, interesting. Just by that logic, right? Yeah. Oh, and it turns out it's actually true mm. that if we focus on removing waste, we put processes in to remove waste and processes introduce more waste and, and you end up in this weird traumatic cycle mm. that it doesn't actually lead to a more efficient organization. It's this funny paradox. It's a, a counterintuitive thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you got the organization to focus on value, what do you get more of? Mm, value. And what do you get less of? Things that un- are un- waste. Yeah, Absolutely. Waste. You yeah. start to become more waste aware. Well, that doesn't feel as valuable as that. Yeah. You with me? Yeah. And I think gratitude journals, just personally, if you manage yourself, mm. highlight the things that you want. That's like being focused on value. Yeah. It's like saying, hey, these are all the things I'm really grateful for. You're almost inviting that into your center of view and you're saying, I'm focusing on that. Mm-hmm. So it tends to give you more of it, yeah. setting intentions, which also then starts to starve energy or remove energy from the things that are wasteful or distracting. Interesting. Does that so, work with friends as well? Like you have friends that aren't necessarily supportive of you and you focus on the ones well, that give you value? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but yeah. We're on the tail end of this, so we've got five yeah. minutes. So no closing worries. remarks to mm. like, like, how do we find you? How do we go more into these concepts? Like, awesome. Just yeah, thank Close you. it out for us, mate. Okay, so uh, business agility is a hot topic. There's a movement around this. I'm pleased to, to report that um, there is more science and framework and tools available for people to, to pick up. Um, I'm part of an organization called uh, Surge.coach, mm-hmm. and, um, and we specialize in helping or partnering with business leaders um, to, to uh, optimize customer value and, and employee value. So we, we help them um, find their way, their path uh, to agility. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things that, that can help with that. And we're currently running a uh, survey mm-hmm. that or a self-assessment tool that we're inviting all businesses to do. And then we publish the results anonymously, of course, yeah. and with aggregates. So we can see, you can slice by sector and that sort of thing. So if you're an insurance company, you could say, how do we measure up against the frameworks of business agility Mm -hmm. uh, compared to our peers maybe? And that might give us an industry sector insight and our own insight. Um, It's called the business agility radar. And I'll, I'll share the link with you surge.coach forward slash B A R capital letters. Um, And so, yeah, so that's a self assessment tool, 12 questions. It gives you a little pretty picture that you can take. And a lot of our, uh, a lot of people that we speak to that do that survey say it's incredibly insightful and really valuable and it's okay. totally free and it's out there. All right, um, like so it. that's one, one contact point. Yeah. Um, Surge Coach are always uh, keen on uh, having conversations with businesses that are uh, kind of inspired to change and try things. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also a community leader for Collectively, mm-hmm. which is kind of how we got connected. Yeah. Um, Collectively is a network of business owners across Aotearoa. We've got about um, 14,000 now um, and it's a pretty special community yeah. um, when you're a business owner and you're running a business um, it can often be quite lonely yeah. um, you, you're feeling me right mm-hmm. it's, um, and it's, it, it's hard to run the business it's also even harder to grow it <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of um, ways of supporting each other okay. uh, in those communities um, so yeah collectively.nz is the one and search.coach is another way to find me alright nice well yeah I'll have that in the description and uh, yeah, thank you. I actually learned a lot and it was interesting. And we cool. finally got to finish what you had I to know, say, mate. It's a win. <laughs> so um, anyone wanting to be a beautiful business, well, click the link and fill out the survey because I'm going to learn from the survey. Potentially, hopefully we'll see if I'm allowed to do it. But, awesome. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. Ka, ka kite. Ka kite. Wait, hang on a minute, guys. What? We can't end this podcast without talking about working in a submarine. <laughs> <laughs> you have to ask and tell the audience, how often do you meet someone who works in a submarine? You've got to ask All right, well, sure. for the audience members, uh, the, <laughs> the, the, it's a follow-on question. <laughs> it's the encore. <laughs> the chief audio consultant here is... Uh, Reminded us we neglected a certain topic around submarining, and uh, I should have asked. So just close out on this submarine 
thing because it's 11 on the dot. Yeah. And you got to be places. Yeah. <laughs> uh, submarine. So, what's it like in a submarine? What's what do you it like do? in a submarine? Do they have that thing that goes up and looks around? Is it's it changed? Periscope. Yeah. yeah. Periscope. Yep. They had periscopes. Yeah. <laughs> so I served on a diesel electric submarine. Yeah. Um, which is a slightly older technology than the nuclear submarines we might have heard about, and it doesn't launch missiles or anything like that. Yeah. Um, it was a torpedo. Uh, mainly torpedo boat, okay, um, and known as a class uh, called hunter killers. Um, so in the world beneath the waves, yeah, um, uh, it's better to be really quiet. Uh, that gives you an advantage yeah. as opposed to being very noisy because if you're noisy underwater, you give your position away. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, so this particular boat was designed to be extremely quiet ah. um, and it's uh, uh, it, it can it has an incredibly long range um, so it could do all sorts of um, crazy operations. And, mm. yeah, so my right. role on board was uh, uh, an electrical weapons specialist. Um, <laughs> so I'd work with um, sonar firing solutions for torpedoes and um, plosh uh, planes and... Um, and steering, you know, helm, that Jeez. sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so now you just te- torpedo CEOs that are. Hey, I was pretty. Not agile. I was pretty young at the time. It yeah. was just an amazing experience coming out of school. That would be my first job. I mm. was conscripted into the the South African military, oh, wow. um, and found my way there. I'm very very pleased and privileged and uh, to to have had that experience. It was also at the time. This is probably a topic for another talk, maybe. Yeah. Um, but at the time when Nelson Mandela um, was taking over. Oh. Uh, his presidency and so uh, right in the front row seats of mm. um, of a historic moment yeah it's cool um, yeah so wow amazing well everyone's waiting on bated breath so I don't, I, <laughs> we'll see if there's another installment but if there isn't then uh, I'm sure we'll run into each other again my friend we will we will alright awesome. well, that was cool awesome Sweet. thanks though